Your Eminence, thank you so much for joining CNBC. Lebanon today is well into an economic crisis, now a political crisis as well. Poverty doesn't discriminate, and people are actually beginning to starve. People I speak to tell me that it will take a miracle to fix Lebanon. Is that where you come in? A miracle? Sure. So we always rely on the divine provenance, but the Lebanese political leaders should take on their responsibilities. If they don't do so, at least they shouldn't block the divine will. If God wants the best or the well-being of the people, this doesn't mean that the leaders keep on disrespecting their people, the state and the constitution of its institutions. This is something that we don't accept from them. So sure, we always pray for a divine miracle, but we ask the leaders to face their responsibilities because there is a saying that says, rise, so that the divine sky helps you. Your Eminence, when you say the political leaders, who are you referring to specifically? Are we talking about the president? Are we talking about the prime minister? Who needs to move forward? It depends on the issue. If we talk about the issue of government formation, I mean the president and the prime minister designate. However, if we talk about general issues, whether they are legislative, I mean the parliament. If we talk about the administrative issues, I mean the ministries. So in a few words, I regret that the leaders or the figures who are responsible for the general interest in the Lebanese state don't fulfill their duties as they should. I mean here, serving the general well-being. Today, there is no general well-being. It doesn't exist. Politics always turns around serving the general well-being, from which emanates the well-being of all the Lebanese and every Lebanese citizen. I want to ask you about Hezbollah specifically. You said there can be no two states in one state and no two armies in one state. We all exist in reality, however, as much as we want to live in hope. And the reality is that Hezbollah is here. They are the Lebanese as much as anyone else. How do you negotiate with them? You say you want Hassan Nasrallah to speak to you directly. How do you bring them into some kind of an agreement? It's possible that we meet together, but neither him nor I have the capacity to address the issue of arms, because this issue is way bigger than Lebanon. In Lebanon, under Michel Suleiman, who is the predecessor to the current president, the issue of the mutual defence strategy was raised. In other words, Hezbollah shouldn't remain free or using arms whenever he wants and wherever he wants, and shouldn't be capable of deciding wars in Israel, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, with disregard to the government, the president and the parliament. So the idea of mutual defence strategy was raised, but it wasn't realised. President Awun, in taking his oath, mentioned among the first points the mutual defence strategy but it didn't even get discussed. And President Aoun today is almost around the end of his mandate. Hezbollah, like the army or any other army in the world, is not entitled to make a decision or decide to go into war or peace. But it is the state is the one that decides. In Lebanon, this is first an internal step. But the cause of Hezbollah and the arms is much bigger than Lebanon and has to be addressed on the international level. Personally, I met once with Hezbollah and we discussed issues that don't have anything to do with arms because this is something that is beyond us. We can talk about other issues. When you think about that plan for neutrality, it's very difficult to be neutral when a large portion of the population is pointing a gun at you heavily armed, and of course I'm referring to Hezbollah, who do you see as a partner in government to create that neutrality, to find that neutrality? Because you can't negotiate when you're essentially held hostage. I haven't heard yet directly from Hezbollah if he is against or with neutrality. If they say I'm against, 
I asked him, are you against the sovereignty of Lebanon? You don't want Lebanon to be a sovereign state on its territory. If it's true that you don't want neutrality, you don't want Lebanon to fulfill its role. Anyway, I assert that there has been no sincere or clear position with regards to neutrality from Hezbollah. And I'm waiting. And I call upon them to a meeting here, where we will talk about neutrality and all of its aspects, because neutrality is in the interest of all Lebanese and first Hezbollah, because they are Lebanese as well. So neutrality is in the interest of all. When you think about this with regards to the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal, the United States right now is engaged in indirect talks with Iran in Vienna. Do you believe a new agreement with Iran would alleviate the problem of Hezbollah in Lebanon? We say, and this is what we asked from the Americans that we met. We asked them not to make Lebanon a negotiating card between the US and Iran when they want to settle the nuclear issue. And as I said before, the issue of arms should be addressed with Iran, because Iran is the source. And it's very well known that Hezbollah, as everyone says, actually, they don't like to be called a militia. I would say an Iranian military force in Lebanon to combat Israel. Why should they combat Israel from Lebanon? If you want to fight Israel, why do you use Lebanese territory? There's also another element with regards to arms and other issues. We want an international conference. We also want the Security Council to take resolutions around the arms issue and the militias that exist in Lebanon. And around the issue of Lebanon extending its sovereignty into all the Lebanese territory. There are as well two major resolutions, 1559 and 1701, that were taken by the Security Council. So on that level, these issues should be addressed and not on the internal Lebanese level. This should be taken into consideration. When you talk about international partners, the French tried to help Lebanon and failed. The Americans are working very hard to cut a deal with Iran. Who do you see as your international partners in trying to resolve the situation in Lebanon today? The international community, i.e. UN-backed conference in which specifically the permanent members of the Security Council are represented. There's also something called GIS, International Group of Support for Lebanon. During the mandate of President Suleiman, the objective was to support Lebanon economically by the five permanent members of the Security Council, plus Germany, Italy and Britain. So these are the countries involved in this process. And these are the countries who should take responsibility if you want peace in Lebanon, and not only in Lebanon, because Lebanon is the point of entry of peace in the Middle East. Lebanon is also the point of entry to stability in the Middle East. If we really want stability in the Middle East, this should go through Lebanon. Peace also goes through Lebanon. That's why the issue of Lebanon should be addressed. It's been described to me, Lebanon, Lebanon's the patient on the operating table and Hezbollah's the cancer. How do you get rid of the cancer without killing the patient? Because it seems as if they've got all the leverage. Sure, I want to repeat, there is a problem in Lebanon. And this problem needs to be addressed. And it can only be addressed by an international conference in all of its aspects. I don't want to use words that can harm anyone, but I say there is a problem in Lebanon and the country is not moving forward. It's stalling. We cannot move forward. We used to be the Switzerland of the East until 1975, i.e. before Syria and Israel interfered and before militias were born from different parties. We used to be the Switzerland of the East in its full meaning, not because of the beautiful nature of Lebanon, but also with wealth, prosperity, growth, and I witnessed that personally. When I was young, 
In the 50s and 60s, we witnessed prosperity in Lebanon. We didn't used to have a poor class in Lebanon because the middle class used to represent 80% of people up until the civil war. But today, what we have become, two millions out of four millions live in dire poverty and hunger. What does that mean? This means that things have stalled in Lebanon. So this patient, who is called Lebanon, needs to be treated. So let's first diagnose his illness. Let's evaluate his sickness on every level. And this can only be done by an international conference for Lebanon with regards to different issues that we are looking at. But are you getting enough from the United States in terms of support? Yes, and we resort to the United States because it has always encouraged and supported the Lebanese army. It deserves our big thanks. They always speak positively about Lebanon, but now we want more. We want the US to support the international conference, to help us achieve neutrality, to keep on supporting the Lebanese army, to send humanitarian aid to Lebanon, to help delineate the frontiers with Israel. If this is done fast, Lebanon can benefit from the oil and gas that can be extracted. So these are the things that we ask from the US through its ambassador and the officials who visit us. And we have high hopes in this regard on this issue. There is also a big Lebanese loyal community living in the US. There is also friendship between us and the US because we consider America as a friend. That's why we solicit the Americans to be more active or effective on the ground. And as I already mentioned in the UN talks with Iran, Lebanon should not be a victim. Rather, these talks should be an opportunity to rescue Lebanon from the current dire situation. Have the politicians, the leadership, the president, his party, the prime minister, designate, have they lost your confidence? I say to them, it's your duty. It's your responsibility. For you as the president who is leading the country, for you as Prime Minister designate who is responsible for forming the government. You are obliged by duty and by your natural conscience to sit together and form the government. That's why we are both equally responsible. Because the formation of the government is the responsibility of both and that's why I am sad for both. Do you believe they can do it? Do you believe they can sit together? This is a national duty of conscience. For both have the national conscience, they should sit together today and not wait until tomorrow. Because the country is collapsing economically, financially, monetary level, there is hunger. Half the Lebanese are poor and hungry. And the authority cannot sit back and only look. If they fail to sit together and form a government, you think they should go? Saying that they should go is an easy word, but it's a difficult one. The issue is that if there is anyone who doesn't take on his personal responsibility, the constitution doesn't propose solutions. And unfortunately, in Lebanon, there is no authority that can take a decisive action where there is a problem on the national level. After the Taif agreement, one of the biggest voids was that there is no decisive authority. And this doesn't exist anywhere in the world. And the conflict continues. While the state is collapsing, the people are dying and emigrating. There is no decisive authority on any level. So for all of these reasons, I call for an international conference to address these specific pending issues. Because they have neither a solution in the constitution, nor are they capable of sitting together and addressing the constitutional issues. Neither the parliamentary authority, nor the executive, nor the president, while the country is dying. Lebanon used to be Switzerland of the Middle East. Today it is hell, like the president once said. This is not something we can be proud of. 
That's why we badly regret. And what about the IMF? The conversations with the IMF. They can't move forward unless the government agrees to meaningful reforms. They're a lifeline. First, we need a government to engage in reforms. And when the reforms start, the government can hold talks with the IMF and the countries can open up to help the Lebanese state so that there is a leitmotif being repeated first. Form a government, start the reforms, and when we are ready, you will see us and be ready to give us the needed aid. But they are not working on the government formation, and I don't understand why. And they don't want reforms, and they don't want aid, so I don't understand why. Do you want hunger? Do you want to make people hungry? Is this the essence of politics? You know without a government we cannot do anything. As for the caretaker government, no one recognized it, neither internally nor externally. It was a government without being a real one, and it could only fulfill internal functions. That's why no one, no international countries, gave it their trust. So we can say practically that we've been without a government for one year or so. If as is alleged, Riyad Salameh, the central bank governor, has given favors to family members, as it's been alleged. Uh, Would you still support him in his position? <laughs> you know, once after one of my positions, there was a big backlash in the country, and I was called the shepherd of corruption. Nothing can be done without a government, let's be realistic. The government is known as the executive authority, that means any decision that needs to be executed in the state needs a government who will decide here and who will ensure the follow-up. It's been said that this position was taken by the caretaker Diab's government. It's okay. It's good. So why didn't they execute it? We told them to go ahead, form a government, so that everything on all horizons can be opened up. From the forensic audit, to economic issues, to financial ones, to stopping the rise of the dollar. Everything can be on track. So you need to address all the issues. As I said, this shouldn't be a selective process. It should be a general, exhaustive one. In other words, the central bank lent money to the state. And this is a normal issue, but the indebtor shouldn't give the money back to the creditor. Does he take money to waste it or to give it back? You, the state, the ministries, the administration, all of the institutions, you took credits from the central bank. Don't you want to give it back? And here do we get the creditor accountable and not do so for the indebtor? And that's why I said the process shouldn't be selective, it should be exhaustive. They should say they want to engage the forensic audit on all. But you can't do the forensic audit without a government. You need executive authority to do so. Otherwise, we can keep talking for 20 years ahead in vain or in the air. This is what has been understood as I'm protecting the corruption. Simply, I'm saying everyone should be held accountable according to their responsibilities. And that includes Riyad Salameh if he is proven to have been corrupt. I don't know who the corrupt is, because this can be shown by the forensic audit. I don't accuse anyone. I neither protect anyone nor accuse anyone. I'm with no one. I'm with the truth and justice, wherever it is, starting with me before anyone else. If I made mistakes, if I committed a crime, hold me accountable. But I'm not in a personal position to judge all. Do you support the revolution? We support the civilized revolution that doesn't let some people with ill intentions, people who want to destroy the public and private properties. I always used to say to the revolution, we are with you, we bless your moves on one condition, be civilized. Don't lead your revolution against the people, don't block roads anymore, don't burn tires. It's forbidden because like this you are punishing the citizens. Hold civilized protests and it's your right. Get organized, set your goals. Don't have unrealistic demands. 
and you have to be the new elite for the new Lebanon. Do you believe they should come back to the streets? Sure, especially now. But on the condition of not blocking roads or burning tires. So especially now, holding protests in which they express their refusal to accept not having a government, whatever it takes. I want to tell you a story. When there was a two and a half year presidential void, I used to convene here ambassadors of the Security Council members and also with members of the Group of Support for Lebanon. And here I mean around 10 people. We used to meet regularly and they would ask me, there's no people in Lebanon, where are the people? No one protests, goes to the street, no one expresses anything. The country has been without a president for two and a half years and no one says anything. There's no people. These words used to hurt me. <laughs> and when the revolution started, I used to tell them, you know, in Lebanon, we should thank God that now the people have awakened. And now they rise and say, we don't accept. We don't accept you turning Lebanon into hell. That is why this revolution should continue, on the condition of remaining a civilized revolution, as I said. So you think the establishment should go? And the revolutionary <laughs> movement should be the new elite? I don't mean everybody. In general, the political class has failed in Lebanon. Some of them are very good people, but generally speaking, the political class and the governing class has failed. And the proof is the current situation and why we don't do change, why we don't make changes in Lebanon. All the world faces change. In Lebanon, the warlords are in power today, and this doesn't exist anywhere else. The warlords made the war, and today they govern. Your Eminence, I asked you at the start of the interview about whether or not Lebanon needs a miracle. What do you believe the miracle should be? Let me tell you what I pray for. I pray for God that you are the only one able to affect the conscience and hearts of the responsible people directly. And I name them the President, the Prime Minister designate, their advisors, and all of the people around them with regards to the government's formation. I hope you can appeal to their conscience, God. I appeal to you, God, again to appeal to their conscience and move their hearts so that they can realize the danger of the situation, so that they feel the danger of the current reality, so that they bear responsibility under your enlightenment and form a government so that Lebanon gets out of the dire reality it is going through, along with its people. Your Eminence, thank you for joining CNBC. Thank you very much.